Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, here, my name is Emma Walsh. I direct the Creative Writing Workshop uh, at the University of New Orleans. Uh, I'm here with one of our former MFA students uh, to help celebrate uh, his new book uh, in partnership with the Tennessee Williams Festival. Uh, the CWW at UNO has been a partner with the Tennessee Williams Festival for nearly 30 years now. Uh, and so we're always so excited when they um, invite us uh, to share their great international stage, which they have. Uh, and I could not be uh, more excited to share it with Andrew Segrist. Uh, this is Andrew, who's in the other square of your screen here. Um, Andrew was a student of ours at the University of New Orleans um, from, I guess, 2013 to 2016. Is that about right? That's right. Something like that. I was uh, lucky enough to have Andrew in several of my classes uh, and uh, be not only a teacher of his, but become a friend of his and ultimately just a great admirer of his work. Uh, and I was I was that way as soon as he got to campus. So uh, uh, it's just it's nice many years later to see other people finally be able to share and what I've known about for a long time. And if you are looking for what you want to get, it is this book right here. We imagined it was rain, which is Andrew's uh, debut story collection. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just sort of uh, get Andrew to talk as much as he can about his work and his books, and I will uh, and his book, and I'll be here just to sort of ask questions, right? Um, so Andrew, uh, first of all, welcome. Thanks for that. Now. Yeah, you look you look healthy as always. I appreciate it. <laughs> right. Uh, Andrew lives in Tennessee, which endows him with a certain health. Um, not, it doesn't do that to everyone, uh, but that's good. Uh, Andrew, if you could, um, so like I've said, you just had your first book come out uh, mm -hmm. about a year ago, right? It's a collection yeah. of short stories. Uh, before we get too deep into the book itself, I was wondering if you might just tell people uh, a little bit about your journey up to this book, right? And one of the ways I like to think about this question is, Going back as far as you can uh, to when you first realized that you were sort of a weirdo, right? Like uh, going back to that moment where you recognize, okay, maybe I'm a little bit different than my friends in the way that I look at uh, books, the way that I read or the way that I think yeah. about stories, right? Um, take us back to that, maybe that one of those first moments where that dawned upon you and lead us up to this, this great moment right now. So I have kind of an embarrassing answer to that question because often when I see interviews with writers, they talk about, you know, they were six years old and they knew they were going to write or they were reading at three years old or whatever. And, and for me, I came to it very late. You know, I didn't read a book until I was like 18. I didn't start writing. The first writing course I took was in college when I was like 20 or 21. Mm -hmm. So I came to it very, very late. But um to answer your question, I think the, the, the moment I thought that I wanted to try this out, uh, I read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Mm -hmm. And I'd never read anything like that before. And I thought, if you're allowed to do this with fiction writing, I'd like to give it a shot. Like if you can write the way he writes or, or you know, even imagine the things he, he came up with, I was, I was like, yeah, okay, I know I can't do what he did, but I want to, I want to, I want to give that world a shot. Right. At, le at least just keep throwing yourself against the wall, trying to, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. And so this was, you said this was in college that you came across this. Yeah. Okay, great. And so, all right, there you are, um, a young, uh, you know, undergrad reading one of the great uh, works of literature that exists, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can remember, it's one of those books. I remember exactly where I was the first time I read that too. Uh, I was in a, uh, a guy named Professor Kronick's class at LSU as an undergrad and was assigned that book and a similar reaction like what what is this right um, we can do this okay uh, well, so, like, I was saying like, I got I, I came to reading so late that when I got to college um, on my you know campus tour the first day I was on campus they took us to the library mm -hmm. and she showed us a three-story beautiful library just as many books as you can see. And then she showed us the computer. She said, if, if we don't have a book that you want, you can just go type it into this computer and they have like interlibrary loan and they'll just send it yeah. to us. So all of a sudden I went from being, I've never read a book in my life to having access to every single book 
right. that's ever been published in the matter of you know a year. <laughs> so yeah, I just I would take home stacks of books every day and just just read all. Right. Of them. And so as a quick aside, if that's not a good enough advertisement for why we should not defund higher education the way that we do in this country, there you go, right? Yeah. So, so all right, so you're an undergrad, you come across this book. Well, lots of people came across a good book in college, right? That didn't lead them to where you are now, right? So, so take us through that moment where you're like, okay, well, maybe I want to try this myself, right? What was the process like from you deciding you wanted to start writing stories to actually have an, a book out with a great press and getting great reviews. So I actually went to two different colleges. The first college I went to didn't have a creative writing program. Mm. So I was just kind of in my dorm room scribbling sentences in a notebook. Mm -hmm. And I happened to transfer to the College Charleston, which has a very good creative writing program. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I took a writing workshop I was hooked and I would take as many as they would let me take um and just the whole process of you know writing a story bringing it in and people giving you feedback and editing it and like the whole all of it was you know so fascinating to me and I just got hooked after that first work mm -hmm. workshop so okay so still we're we're in your undergrad right and so um and for people watching this who might not know it does take a special kind of person to uh, be willing to like give their best imaginative effort, you know, on a story that they've made up, bring it in and have like 10 to 20 people come back to them and say, eh, you know, this, this part of it eh, didn't really do it for me, or I had no idea what you were talking about here, right? It takes a sort of special kind uh, to take that, I think, and use it as fuel to keep going rather than use it as an excuse to quit, right? I mean, I think that, you know, I've taught undergrad workshops for a long time. And there's lots of students that are full of promise, but they don't like getting that, you know, sort of criticism back. And so they stop, right? They see it as a reason to stop. You did not do that. You saw it as a reason to keep going, right? And so uh, you're starting to get that feedback. Uh, take us through the next few years when you started getting really serious about it. So I'll, I'll say this, I was not great in undergrad and um, I, after I graduated, I took a couple years and just, you know, work, construction just, work and- Just turning tricks, things like that. Yeah, and yeah. exactly. And um, it's funny, I was, I was working construction and I remember it was the mid of winter and I think it was the coldest week of that winter in Tennessee that year. And I was on a roof scraping paint off the side of a house for an entire week. And I went home one night and I happened to see a YouTube video and it was uh, a promotional video for the creative writing pro program at Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, they were talking about how, you know, they're going to give you three years just to work on your craft. And it was, they were showing videos of people in Tom Franklin's backyard, you know, sipping wine and, talking about writing and books and I'm up on the roof scraping paint <laughs> off. And I'm like, I gotta get back. I gotta, I gotta get back in school. And that's when I applied to University of New Orleans and luckily got in. Well, yeah, well, I'm sure you applied. Did you apply only here or you applied to several places? I applied to probably eight places, yeah. Right, so anyone watching should know, don't just apply to one place, right? Uh, apply to several places. It's a, it's a really weird, uh, competitive landscape out there um, for people trying to get into creative writing fields, right? So can I, can I say one, one, one other thing? I didn't it? realize how competitive it was. Mm -hmm. So when I first decided I wanted to go to a graduate program, I didn't research it. I didn't look up any deadlines. I didn't look up any programs. I just started telling people that I was going to go to graduate school for creative writing. Mm -hmm. And when it finally came time for me to like actually apply, all the deadlines had passed. <laughs> so I had to wait an entire year right. because I hadn't done any of the research. I didn't know that it was like that competitive. I didn't know like I needed to actually apply to multiple places. And right. uh, so I, it took me a year to, to, you know, get all my ducks in line and work on my manuscript. And, but luckily it all worked out. Yeah, good. So, so now that you bring up the idea of years, 
right? Yeah. Let's start talking about the years from between the moment you're like, okay, this is what I want to do for a living. This is my passion. This is what I, you know, this is how I want to sort of pay back, um, you know, all the favors the world has done for me, right? Which is the way I see about right, uh, the way I think about writing most of the time. Uh, this is how I want to do it. Well, let's yeah. talk about the years from that moment. You get accepted to an MFA program. You enter that. It was a what six to seven year stretch from that to the book coming out, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that process, if you don't mind. Well, I, I had a very fortunate piece of advice early on. A writer told me, like, um, if this is the life you want, if you want to pursue this, you can you can do it. Um, but it's going to you, you have to be able to put in the years like you're saying. And he said, you know, it might be eight years. It might be 10 years. Mm -hmm. But if you're just persistent and you keep going, uh, you, you can you can have it. You can you know, you can publish stories. Um, but you would got to put the years in. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, especially when I was first starting out, you want to write a story, send it out, get it published in the Paris Review in a month mm -hmm. and it just that's not the way it works right and so i think uh luckily i had that piece of advice where early on i knew that like that's that wasn't going to be my path um yeah so i just had i had the mindset very early on that like you know if, if i'm if i can just stick it out if i'm willing to put in 10 years i, I could I, I didn't know that i could have a book out but i knew mm -hmm. that i could probably have some stories in mm -hmm. a magazine somewhere. And that's, you know, that was my mindset early on. Okay, so I'm gonna take a quick little detour here because uh, I wanna get back to the, I wanna, I wanna talk about the actual process of you writing these stories, trying to publish them individually and then go to the book, but quick little detour. You said, you know, you don't know if you have a book but you'd have some stories uh, come out. Talk a little bit about to you, what's like, what's the purpose of that? You know what I'm saying? Like, like, why did you want that? Like, as, as a as a human being, uh, as a writer, because you know, I think that a lot of people would say, okay, well, you want that because you're going to get paid for it, right? That's our sort of capitalist thinking, right? But a lot of what happens in the literary world is you're not getting paid really for any of these uh, smaller publications. I mean, if you do get paid, it's a nominal amount. It's not it's not enough to like you know go take that dream trip you know 60 miles down the road that you've been wanting to take. Um, so tell us about that. What, what was your urge to do that? Why, did you, why do you want to publish? Why do you want to get stories out? I think it's just the, the idea of you come up with something, you know, on your computer screen, <laughs> and all of a sudden it's a tangible, physical thing that you can hold. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not getting paid for it, like, I don't know, I just always wanted to see, I wanted to be able to hold something that I had made, you know, um, and it took a long time, but, you know. Well, you could print it out on your computer and hold it yourself. What is it about publishing that made you want to do that? Maybe it's like the validation of, of that someone else thinks it's worthy of, of printing and putting a binding on and yeah. sending it out to, you know, a couple hundred people. Right. Someone else, someone else out there, right? That's, that's what it seems uh, to me so much of writing is about is just trying to communicate with, you know, with strangers, you know, um, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where that urge comes from. Uh, but it's, it's the realest one to me, because like, I think about that all the time, we could just type it up on our word processor, have it on our computer, and we should be satisfied if all we want to do is get a story down. But well, we wanna... you, like, 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 so the difference between you write a story, and you just put it on your blog, and mm -hmm. you can publish it online and anytime you want, what do you think the difference is between that and actually having, you know, the Greensboro Review in your hand or whatever it is? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's what you were saying earlier. To me, it's a certain level of sort of validation, right? And it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's the idea that, you know, I know that I, I know that I can just write anything and post it on my website, and it might be just as beautiful as anything that's in a magazine, right? It, it's very possible, right? Uh, but the idea that, no, I'm actually going to put myself out there. I'm going to make myself open to criticism, make myself open to rejection, right? And hopes that I'm going to have someone sort of, you know, a magazine or whatever, put their arm around my shoulder and say, no, no, we hear you, 
right? I mean, we we understand what you're trying to communicate, yeah. and we want and we want to sort of um, put a bullhorn to that message. You know, what I'm saying we want we want to sort of broadcast uh, whatever beauty it is that you are you are cooking up, right? I also think uh, you you mentioned rejection. I think the fact that we have to go through so many rejections when you do get the acceptance, that's it makes it so much sweeter than just right. posting it online. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, as soon as you said it earlier, and I, I'm going to get back on track in a second, but as soon as you said uh, earlier, I thought that I was going to get there, I was going to write a story, and the Paris Review was going to take it, you know, in a couple of months or whatever. I think that everyone feels that way, and I knew I felt that way for sure when I first started writing, right? And people watching this may have no idea, but I've, I've had a long writing career too, so I do exactly what Andrew does, right? Uh, and so I, I also felt that way, and I wanted it immediately. But I'm sort of glad, you know, when I think back about it, that it doesn't happen that way, right? Because to me, the truth of the matter is the work gets better, right? The longer you, you know, you sit on it and you think about it. And if it was that type of thing where your first draft was always like out there immediately, uh, yeah. would you look back at it 10 years later and think, you know what, that's the best I could do? I, I don't think you would. Right. Yeah. And, and so one of the things and I'll go back to your book. I mean, one of the things that's so remarkable about your book is that it has it has that sense, um, at least, you know, at least to me. And I know other people that have read it and critics that have read it, it has that sense of like having existed for a long time. Right. You know, I mean, you're, you're one of those writers that feel like uh, feel like they've sort of um, been here for a while, even though it's your first book. Right. And I think it's because those stories just feel very lived in. Uh, and the people, you know, the people feel real. The imagery feels, uh, you know, very, um, what, it, it doesn't feel uh, like you just, you just, you know, sort of uh, shot it off. It feels like you lived with it, you sat with it, and these are the best ways that you can communicate these things, right? And so I would be shocked if you look back at this book in 10 years and aren't still proud of it, right? That's, I think that's what you want, right? I mean, you want to go back and look at your work and say, you know what? No, it might not be for everybody, but that's the best I could do, right? <laughs> that's what you want. So let's talk about this. So you're in the you're in a, um, a creative writing program uh, here at uh, University of New Orleans. You're surrounded by other writers. Like all you're doing is talking writing, really, for a period of about three years. Mm -hmm. In that time, uh, you wrote a bunch of stories uh, for you know for class for assignments. Uh, I'm sure some more you know you felt more successful than others. Tell us about the process of taking all those stories you wrote over that three year period and then turning it into this book? How did that go down? Well, the thing that was uh, yeah, the difficult about kind of putting it into a collection was that, you know, when you're in the MFA, you're on a deadline to write a story. And that's kind of all, at least for me, I was only thinking about that one story. So like, you know, you have a story due in three weeks. I wasn't thinking of it as an entire collection at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I graduated, I had all these stories, but I had never really thought of them as like a unified collection. So then you had mm -hmm. to, I had to like go back through them and see which ones I thought maybe fit together and then how to organize them in a way that, you know, seemed congruent. Um, that's one thing I wanted to ask you because your collection, Prospect of Magic, was more of a unified collection. And did you like, think about that ahead of time or? Well, I mean, I think that there's two things I would say about that. I mean, one, it was, uh, it was, it was for me, that, that book was about me learning that I work better under like certain parameters, right? And so in other words, if you just tell me, go write about anything you want, mm -hmm. I will be totally shut down and I, I will have no ideas, right? But if you're like, okay, you're in this room right here. I'm in my garage right now. You're in this room. You need to write a story about this room. I have no problem, right? I can, I can start generating ideas. Yeah. Right? And so to me, it was more about, okay, setting parameters. So once I wrote one story that was sort of set in that town that my first book is set in, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just going to stick with this town. I'm going to stick with this idea, right? And that helped me. So the, the smaller the space for me, the sort of more ideas I can generate. Okay, That's the, what I learned at, at, when I was in New Orleans is the importance of constraints on writing. Because yeah. um, you think about uh, 
you know, if you can just write about anything you want, and, mm-hmm. and that seems like it's a endless possibilities, but the more constraints that you can put on a story or a book, I feel like actually opens it up more. Yeah, and lots of ways, the richer it becomes, because the more sort of, uh, you know, dialed in and crystallize your vision becomes, right? So, so let's do this. So for anyone who might be watching this, thank you, by the way, but if they don't know anything about your book, can you tell us a little bit sort of just about the book? You know, you said that you said that yours is not quite as unified. I find your collection to be very unified, right? So, so what would you say uh, unifies it? What's the flavor of it? Uh, maybe give us uh, a sort of, you know, a big picture idea of what the collection is like. And then if you wouldn't mind after that, maybe read just like a couple minutes so we get a sense of the music of it. Yeah, so the, I think that what unifies it is um, I grew up in splitting time between Middle Tennessee, sort of on the river, and uh, in the mountains in Southeast Tennessee. And so when I was writing these stories, I kind of just, in my head, just combined those two settings mm-hmm. and thought I can just, you know, because it's a work of fiction, I can, I can write a story that's on the river and in the mountains kind of mm-hmm. simultaneously. Um, so I think the setting is sort of what unifies um, this collection. And there's also, um, uh, there's some, you know, things that recur. There's some recurrent um, characters and images and stuff that, that come up. But I think the setting is the, the main thing that, that really unifies it. Okay. I, um, I would agree with that. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that unifies it is the writer, right? And, you know, with, with, Every book. I mean, that sounds simplistic to say, but it's true. And people often don't realize that that's typically the glue, right? I mean, it is, is what that writer is interested in, the way that they speak, what they look at when they're in a room, as opposed to what you might look at when you're in a room, right? And so to me, what unifies your collection for sure is the voice, you know, it, it, it is this particular writer, even though each story might be about different characters, you know, they're written by the same author, right? And that, that to me is one of the great, uh, that, that's what make a, makes a collection as rich as a novel to me, right? When you recognize you're in the hands of the same writer. Uh, and so if you could maybe read just a little passage for us. Yeah, I'll just read a couple pages. Uh, this is a story called Nothing for the Journey. The boy's hands smelled like asphalt and the girl held them tight like she was afraid if, if the world kept spinning, she'd lose her balance. He'd hung their shoes from a trestle bridge and left them dangling above the water. They both walked slow in the dew wet grass beside a road neither of them had ever been on before. The boy took coins and acorn caps from his pockets and flicked them into the ditch because you can't take nothing for the journey, he said. When, when he wasn't looking, the girl picked up a mercury dime and closed it tight in her fist. She didn't know his name He had green eyes, the color of a memory she couldn't place, and blonde hair cut short and uneven, like he'd done it himself in a room without mirrors. He spoke slow and smiled shy when he looked at her. She worried if he knew anything about her at all, that smile would turn, that brightness in his eyes would dull, and he'd see her the same way everyone else did. So when he asked questions, she lied. She told him her skin was dark from Indian blood, told him when she was in high school, she ran away from home and lived with her grandmother on a reservation in the mountains of North Carolina. Said she could braid bird feathers into patterns that would show the future and that her grandmother gave her nicknames like Smooth Stone, Little Mouse and Bone. They ate breakfast at a diner before the sun came up. She had the the word of the Lord tattooed across the back of her neck and the boy traced each letter with his pinky finger and swore her skin was warmer there somehow. The girl scooted close to him and rested her head against his chest so she could feel the vibrations of his voice. Tell me one thing true, she said, one thing you never told anyone, so it'll just be me and you that know it. The boy's first pet was an imaginary friend named Pumpernickel. Pumpernickel was a sheepdog, had eyes two different colors, and would bark at small bark out small sentences the boy could understand when he was alone. Pumpernickel was hit by a car on the boy's fifth birthday and was buried in the shade of a hemlock tree. Never told anyone that, she said. Promise, he said. 
Cross your heart, she said, hope to die. He kissed her on the top of the head. It was summer and in summer, her hair always smelled like rain. She put her head on his lap and stretched her legs across the vinyl booth. There was a scar running up her ankle and he asked for the story. The truth, she said, and he waited. She'd been pregnant the night she saw lightning and snow at the same time. Her dad called it cloud thunder and she walked out into it and listened to so much quiet be broken by the crack of strange electric blue light. The snow was thick on the ground and she climbed a tree to the high branches to see above it all. Didn't realize her hands had gone numb until she tried to climb down and lost her grip. Her dad laid her in the back of the car and drove to the hospital with her crooked leg raised on a stack of pillows. And that's where they learned about the baby. The doctor said if it had survived, she wouldn't have started showing for a couple weeks. Her dad said it was for the best, that she was only ch a child herself. On the drive home, the lightning had stopped and all around was a covering of white beneath dark sky. The boy wasn't smiling, but the brightness was still in his eyes. And for a moment, the girl let herself believe that he never looked at anyone like that before. Does it still hurt, the boy said. She, she covered the scar on her ankle with a napkin. When bone breaks, she said, it grows stronger where it heals, strong as iron. The check came, she unfastened her necklace and laid it on the table. The necklace was silver, the shape of a feather. He followed her outside and they watched the window as the waitress put the necklace around her neck. Then they crossed the street to the bus station. He didn't ask where she was going. She didn't tell him she was going home, that she'd called her father the night before for the first time in two years. She stepped into the bus, squeezed down the aisle and into a seat behind the window. He stood outside and tossed parking lot gravel at the bus until she looked out. Your name, he said, your name. When she spoke, her breath fogged the glass and he couldn't read her lips. She waited until the bus was far away. She traced her name through a cloud of her breath the cloud of her breath had left against the window. A child stood on the seat in front of her and rested his chin on the seat back. She felt in her pocket for the mercury dime she'd saved that morning. She handed the child the coin. The child put it in his mouth and raised a finger to his lips. She smiled and wiped the fog from the window. Nothing for the journey, not even her own name. Years later, when the boy dreamed, she'd be there walking the dew grass or sitting in a diner with a head against his chest. He would call her Smooth Stone or Little Mouse. And she would know, and she would scatter bird feathers on the table, arranging them so that the future was something they didn't have to fear. And when he was awake, he'd watch for her, imagining her in front of him in the line at a checkout counter in a grocery store somewhere, or moving outside his kitchen window, tapping the glass as if meeting there was something they'd planned. Her hair would be longer, but still the smell of rain, and he would know to call her bone, bone broken, then healed, bone so much stronger than iron. Good, thank you, man. And so for people that are watching, that is from this book here. We imagine it was rain. I've also got written on my cup here. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of, lots of, amazing things about that little piece that you just read. The, the first thing that was spring in my mind is nature imagery, right? Uh, which you use a lot, right? And so just in that, in that piece, very short piece, couple pages, we've got bird feathers, acorn caps, trees, rivers, dewgrass, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah. much of the, of the natural world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then, but then I think about, uh, we have all that type of stuff we're looking at, all that atmospherics, and then all of a sudden in the middle of it, you have the line, you know, and that's when they learned about the baby, right? I mean, there, there's like a very just sort of like, you know, unadorned line in the middle. That's really the, the, the story, right? I mean, the, the sort of the, the human story, right? So I'm going to say that and ask you sort of two questions at once, okay? Um, one is sort of about the role of the natural world. In, in your fiction writing because of, of, you know, the many books I've read, you know, um, especially in the last few years, yours really sticks out in terms of being sort of um, enthralled, 
you know, with it, you know, I mean, there, there's, lot, there's lots of books that you read that, you know, the setting is a, a major part of the book, right? I mean, you, every, I mean, every book has a setting, right? So, I mean, most books, yes, but there's other books that, you know, you read the, the reviews of them and they say, oh, the setting's a character here, place is a character, you know, like, what yeah. the hell does that mean? How does that happen? I, yours, I, I don't even think of it as, as that. I think of it as like, we're dealing with um, probably a writer or an overall narrative voice who's just sort of very enthralled with the natural world and wants to make sure that it's included, right, in, in, in the human stories, okay? And so I, I want you to maybe talk a little bit about that, like your sort of interest in nature as a writer, number one, and then move that, if you can, into... Uh, what it means to be a Southern writer for you, okay? And so, uh, you know, people will call this a Southern book. You you publish with Hub City Press, who their sort of mission statement is sort of publishing Southern literature, right? Um, yeah. And so if you could talk about nature, you know, first uh, and how you write about that, and then we'll go into the idea of being a Southern writer and what that means to you. Yeah, so as far as nature, I mean, I, it's kind of, the only place I draw inspiration from, I think. Like I've, I've never been in a bank and got an idea for a story, <laughs> but I can watch a piece of driftwood drift by the river and be like, oh, I, can, you know, I can write about this all day. Um, so I, I think, you know, for me, it's just that's the only place I, I can draw from. So mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, a Southern writer, you know, I've, I've well, never- uh, I uh, we're not there yet we're not there yet okay so you find inspiration in, in nature good right that okay a lot of people do right people that are walking you know down a ridge with a walking stick in their hand also draw inspiration from nature okay that's not the same thing that you're doing in terms of making it part of your art right and so can you talk to me a little bit or talk to everyone here a little bit more about you know, if this is a story that you just read, you know, about this girl and this pregnancy and all this type of stuff, why is the nature important to it? You know what I'm saying? How does that make, how does nature help make a story for you? So for me, it's not, um, I think it might be the oddities of nature. Like I'm more okay. interested in a crumpled bird feather on the roadside rather than just a typical sunset. Like I like, okay the weirdities of, of that nature can provide sometimes, because I think sometimes those particular strange details can um, propel the story in ways that, you know, maybe I couldn't without, um, you know, putting them in there. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think for me, I think sometimes the images are smarter than I am. And mm -hmm. so I couldn't come up with a certain narrative, but if I just like, put an image in there it starts to propel the story like a like a mm -hmm. unique strange image it'll propel the story in a way that i couldn't have come up with on my own that well that, that's getting into the realm of sort of like trusting your subconscious to do some yeah. of the work right because it's that's funny andrew because when you say that i mean I, like the story itself is about a sort of oddity of nature you know in terms of a uh, human pregnancy right and how that can go or how it cannot go and, and all that type of thing. So like, to me, when you're like, yes, I like these things, I match them with these, I don't even know what I'm doing, right? But there's a harmony there, right? And, and if, there's, if there's not a harmony in those things, then, you, then I think a reader gets a sense of, why is this person talking about trees when what I wanna find out about is the bank heist, right? But that, that's not what's happening here, right? We talk about, coins like you mentioned a couple uh you know one coin is another coin you mentioned uh one color eyes and it changes to a different color eyes uh for later like i mean you're you're doing all sorts of things that you might not recognize but i think yeah. re readers do they feel like oh no this is harmony this is what this sounds like lots of different voices and different octaves coming together right um and so it, it really works so don't stop doing that Right, because uh, <laughs> it's beautiful um, the way you do it, and, and nature is just—it's absolutely one of the things that's just such a knockout about your book. How many things we see and how much we feel about the natural world, right? And so, okay, 
I consider myself a Southern writer. Um, I'm from Louisiana. If people don't know, I write all my books have been about Louisiana. Uh, Andrew's from Tennessee, right? His book is firmly entrenched uh, in that place. Yet when people talk about Southern writers, they talk about a whole lot of different things, right? Um, there's a lot of different Southern writers of, of many different attitudes, um, backgrounds, uh, and everything, right? So, so can you talk a little bit about what does Southern being a Southern writer mean to you, if anything? Yeah, I think um, the more I think about it, the more confused about it I get. Um, just because, like, like, exactly what you're speaking to, like um someone from coastal uh, are you on yeah i'm good okay someone from like coastal south carolina is and then you know west memphis it's the south is such a big region that like you know it's hard to um look at it as this like one unified region so uh you know i i guess i'm a tennessee writer i don't I'm not a Louisiana so, writer. <laughs> right. Not. Exactly. So and so so what does it mean to you? Do you, I mean or do you or do you are you thinking your next book might be set in Montana or do you feel like uh, you want to keep writing about your slice of the south or what do you think? I think I'll always write about Tennessee. Okay. So why is that? That that could change for sure, but um you know, I'm I could set different parts of a book other places but i don't think i would you know i don't think i would ever write a you know new hampshire novel or something <laughs> why not <laughs> i've never been there so. okay so it's about it's about having that access uh to the feeling of a place even like you know i, I spent almost four years in uh new orleans and i would still it would be tough for me to feel like i had the authenticity to write a New Orleans novel, you know, I, you know, just even four years, I don't think is long enough for well, me. Well, if you said it, if you said it in New Orleans, isn't it a New Orleans novel? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would do it justice. I would feel like I was getting it wrong. So that suggests to me that you think there's something more than the setting itself, something more than street names, something more than locations, um about a place when you write about a place is that true yeah i think so and, and um i just remember when i was at university of new orleans i worked for bayou the literary magazine there mm -hmm. and people would constantly send in stories about new orleans mm -hmm. and it was just it, it seemed like they were just kind of clicking off the cliches you know mm -hmm. we're gonna go get beignets and we're gonna go <laughs> do this and we're gonna read the streetcar and it was like i don't know i don't i yeah, I, I don't want to fall into that trap, I think. Right. Yeah, because th th I think that's what I'm trying to get at is like place is so much more than location. You know what I'm saying? I, I, in, to, to, to write about a place and to feel like you can do justice to it, it's so much more about the invisible things, you know, like the, the things that aren't Googleable. Yeah, <laughs> for lack of a better word, right? And and so and, and your book very much feels that way. I mean, it's a. Um, I lived in Tennessee for a while, as you know, uh, in East Tennessee, and your book feels very different to me than my experience of East Tennessee. You know, and it feels very different than my experience of Mississippi and Louisiana, and uh, and ho I, I think to me that's that's the goal, right? I mean, uh, if you consider yourself a Southern writer, like if you consider yourself, no matter what kind of writer you are. You're trying to you're trying to carve out some sort of territory that just feels um, like it's it's yours and and yeah. yours alone and no other writer has done that right um, and, and that's a special thing to accomplish man and you know and I think that you've really done it here I've not I've not read another book like yours. If you um, had southern literature, do you have a definition for that or? Is not at all. And, you know, and um, I mean, I think that there used to be one for sure. Uh, and, you know, back in the in the Faulkner days. And and thank goodness that's no longer it. I mean, it's been exploded. You know what I'm saying? I, it, and that's good. Right. Um, so, I mean, so, no, Southern literature. I mean, I think you can sort of uh, you can define it sort of geographically, yeah. I guess, if you're talking about, you know, the Southern United States. But in terms of 
uh, attitudes, in terms of style, in terms of subject matter, even? No, uh, you can't define it. And that's what, that's what makes it great and very exciting right now, um, for sure, I, I think. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about, why would you want to, def you know, define yourself as a Southern writer? Like, doesn't that sort of like pigeonhole you? I'm like, oh my God, no, are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> Have you read any of the shit coming out of the South? Because it's yeah. awesome and it's so wildly varied and um, yeah, it's it's great, right? So uh, I mean, I don't I don't ask I don't ask you that question to get you to say, you know, this, a Southern writer means like you know, yeah, you know, I'm from the South or whatever bullshit. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just like to me, I, I find it an honor if anyone would ever consider me a Southern writer because I recognize the sort of wealth of uh you know of talent that has come out of the south in literature right and continues to at a really rapid pace yourself included you know i mean you've just added you just added to the canon man um of southern literature you know you've done it you know that now there's a new book that people have to reckon with it's right and it's, when i was in new orleans um a woman came up to me one time at a bar part of you neil knows it yeah. uh, and she said, oh, you're the, you're the Southern writer. <laughs> the only answer I had was like, I'm, I'm from Tennessee. I don't know. Right. That's all I, that's, that's, I guess that's still the answer I still have. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But there, I don't know. To me, I would say there are other things that are reminiscent of Southern literature and sort of the classic way that people might think of it in terms of that uh, sort of, um, uh, what would you say? being sort of wedded to the environment right i mean uh, you can't escape it you know i mean I, I don't i don't think that like you can really it's hard to write a southern book without talking about the the animals the heat the you know <laughs> the, the trees the i mean it'd be, it would be hard to do that because it's just like what are these people looking at you know if they're not looking at that what are they looking at because it's it's so awesome here you know and it's so sort of demanding um that how can narrators not see it yeah right um so okay so let's do this so all right so you've talked about the south a little bit right you thank you for reading uh from your book um now you know and this might be a sort of teacherly question because i'm 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 teaching a, a class right now which is you know, we're, we're having uh, MFA students like read a sort of, you know, contemporary book and then interview the author um, and, you know, trying to get a sense of like what it's like for them to finally have a, their book out, right? So you worked on this thing for many years. You finished your MFA um, in 2016, right? Your book came out in 2021, is that right? 2020, yeah. Or 20, okay, tail end of 2020, okay. Um, so there was even a, a stretch of time afterwards where you kept working on it, getting it ready, okay? Yeah. So the dream has happened, okay? So the book is out, right? So a little while ago, you said, I would be happy if I just had a story published, you know? And now you've got a book out. So talk a little bit about to you, um, what a what a what a sort of writing career means to you now? Like, are you are you ready to hang it up and you're done? I mean, you did the thing, uh, or are you looking for more? And what what does that look like to you? I mean, I, I, I feel like you're always looking for the next. Okay. You know, when I was uh, just starting out, I thought if I could get a story out in like a reputable journal, that would be the greatest thing I could do. And then you mm -hmm. get that, and you're like, all right, well. Maybe I get a one in a little bit better of a journal, and then you you know you kind of work up the ladder that way. Uh, and now it's yeah, I would I would like to have a novel out. Um, that's sort of the next the next so goal. Why do you want that? Why why a novel? Why not uh, more stories or whatever? Why what what are you thinking? I would like more stories too. I would love <laughs> another co collection of stories. <laughs> Any type of book that anyone's willing to publish of mine, I would I would put out. Well, I. I I have no doubt that you're going to write more books, okay? And I had no, I had no doubt of that um, from the moment I first met you, right? Uh, first read your work, I should say, right? Um, because it's just obvious. It's obviously good, okay? You, you're one of those people that's been obviously good for a long time, 
All right. But I would also say this, and you don't have to buy this at all. And I'm, I'm actually forgetting that the audience is here right now. I'm just talking to you. You're my friend and I care about you. I, I care about you. Okay. What, what you just said, I think is so natural and right in terms of like, you're always looking for the next thing. Okay. But I think as a writer, if you, if you, if you're always looking for the next thing, well then like everyone except for like uh, what 50 people since the Nobel prize or whatever has been going have failed. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're always thinking, I got to get the next thing, I got to get the next thing, I got to get the next thing, mm -hmm. then you're eventually going to set yourself up for failure because we're not all going, we're not all going to win the Nobel. Right. We're not all going to win the Pulitzer. We're not all going to win the National Book Award. Right. Um, I want to make sure that you understand that you have already done it, man. Like you, you have like, you have done the thing that so many writers want to do. Right. Uh, and so many talented people, uh, so many hardworking people, it just never, it just never happened for them, right? But they want it, okay? So when it comes to uh, you thinking like, oh my gosh, uh, I got to get the next thing. First of all, understand, be happy, right? Be happy. Uh, so what you after your collection? Oh, no, I, don't get me wrong. I always want more. <laughs> of course. No, you always want it. But what I'm saying is, if that's your only mindset, you'll never be, you'll never uh, take the time to realize, you know what, I actually did something remarkable. Um, and you've done something remarkable, man. I just want to make sure that you recognize that, right? Uh, I know that you won't stop. Uh, and I don't want you to stop. And I want you to keep challenging yourself and doing all these things, right? But do take the time uh, just to smell the roses, man. Um, sure. You know, you've done a really, you've done a really great thing. Uh, and, and if nothing else, you know, uh, people are going to, this book exists forever, right? Uh, and people can go to it and just be reminded uh, of how beautiful it is, okay? So you've got a career, um, you've done the writing thing, and now, uh, yeah, it's just up to you to go explore new territory, right? And see what's out there, okay? So, so let me ask you this. If you were going to go back and, you know, tell yourself something six years ago that, that you know now that you didn't know then, right? What would you tell the younger version of you? Um, six years ago? Yeah, right when you're, right when you're just starting. What would, you, what would you tell them right now? Just be patient. <laughs> you know, I think okay. I, I wanted it all to happen quicker than it, it did, but, you know, um, yeah, just be patient, you know. Be patient, I think. Be patient, okay. Now, how about this? So I know that you uh, have all, have been a, a, you know, voracious reader since I've known you, okay? So for people that are watching this and they heard you read from your uh, your story, they love that sort of lyricism, they love uh, your language, they're interested in your book, what would you say are some of three of the three or four, you know, sort of important texts to you, you know, important writers or important books that you read um, not that you're at all a derivative of, but that you, you recognize you owe a debt to. You already mentioned Marquez. What, what else? Marquez is a big one. Um, Breeze Pancake. He's a huh? West Virginia writer. Um, if you haven't read him, I would. Tell, tell us a little bit about why, why, how did he light you up? Uh, just the structure of his sentences. Um, that's always, I've never been, um, yeah, I've always been like a, a sentence like that's always what's captured me is, is the mm. sentences and the language. So um, Breeze Pancake, um, some writers actually that you introduced me to, Mark Richard, mm -hmm. um, Dale Ray Phillips, mm -hmm. is those two collections yeah, changed a lot for me. Um, mm. Tom Franklin, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think those are a couple good ones to start with if you haven't read them. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel um, similarly in terms of sentence writing. I mean, I mean, I know I've told you this, but like me and my me and my wife, like lying in bed reading, couldn't be two different people reading books, right? I mean, she will have this huge fat novel, and she's just going. I'm like, I'll turn to her and say, "How is it?" She's like, "It's terrible," you know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, "What are you doing?" 
You know, she's like, well, I can't, I gotta, I gotta know how it ends, right? I don't feel that at all. You know, I'm like, I'm, I don't feel that compulsion. I'm like, if these sentences are not good, if I read a bad paragraph, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, I can put a book away very quickly. Me too. Me too. Life is way too short to read books that are not uh, hitting me in the way that I want a book to hit me. And typically, that is like you're saying, sentence level writing, good, clear sentences, paragraphing. You know what I'm saying? Like, if it's doing that to me, if it's surprising me, delighting me uh, in those ways, I don't, I kind of don't care what the plot is. Uh, I'm just along for the ride, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but no, she'll read, she'll just read garbage, man. And she admits it's garbage. Do you have for, any recommendations lately? Lately? I mean, um, a couple of uh, collections that I read recently, uh, uh, Don Teal uh, Milk Blood Heat was really damn good. Okay. Um, I read um, uh, a book, uh, actually I have it right here, uh, Gwen Kirby's Shit Cassandra Saw, this book right here. Uh, it just sort of is, is really good, but it's just really exciting too. She just plays with a lot of forms. Yeah. It's like a really sort of loud, wild, wild book. Um, I'm kind of all, you know, I'm kind of all over the map in terms of what I'm reading. And uh, I just read a novel called Nights When Nothing Happened uh, by Simon Hahn, which is like very quiet book, like as loud as that last one was. This one was very, very quiet. And I loved it because the language is great, yeah. you know? So, so I'm a lot, I mean, I'm there for the writing, man. That's a hundred percent. I'm there for the writing. I'm there to like, just pay respect, you know, like, uh, <laughs> it's like i see what you're doing you're doing it better than i can yeah. much respect i'll follow you wherever you want to go right <laughs> exactly. so I, I know a lot of uh a lot of people that uh, you know are kind enough to tune into things like this and listen to us talk are often interested in sort of you know uh process right and sort of what you know what, what are you doing as like a day job how are you getting the writing hours in you know you talk about all these years like sure you had an mfa experience right which not everyone gets to have where you had three years to really focus on writing but you had four years since then um how are you finding the time to write you've recently uh had a child um mm -hmm. how has that changed you know if you could just talk about your writing process a little bit i'm sure people would be interested yeah so um i think one thing i took away from you i don't know if you remember saying this to me years and years ago was I always felt like if I wasn't getting words down on the page, I wasn't writing. Mm -hmm. But you told me you can write when you're driving your car, you can write when you're you know, working out, mm -hmm. like as long as you're working on a story, working on the, the, the sentences in your head, that still counts. Cause I yeah. always thought you needed a word count. So mm -hmm. lately for me, it's more processing it in my head um, while I'm working or, you know, taking care of the kid it's just but I, I still feel like I'm working on the story in my head and I feel like that you know when I was in grad school I just thought I needed to you know get a thousand words a day on the page and now mm -hmm. it's more yeah working out mentally yeah I mean oh gosh if writers could do billable hours we'd all be wealthy right because <laughs> I mean that's by far the most time I'm my most most of my writing time is not on the page it's like you know when i'm staring blankly uh you know in traffic you know <laughs> sitting you know sitting in carpool or whatever and everybody's like why is this guy not moving yeah. and they start honking at me it's because like i was totally uh -huh. in a story i was working something out yeah um that i might not actually write for another year or so you know i mean it's something yeah. something in the plot or something i'm i'm working something out uh that's what most of the yeah, most of my work happens. Um, I've actually found that I remember stuff better when I write it in my head than when I actually put it on a page. Okay. So I'm thinking of it and I come up with like a plot point or a character, whatever it is, if I'm working through it in my head and kind of really going through it, I'll remember that a lot longer than if I just am writing something down. So it actually is it's counterintuitive, but it actually kind of, it, it feels like it's more productive sometimes. I think that I think that's honestly really true, um, and, and and sort of a, I don't know both positive and negative ways, you know. And so I think that I feel like sometimes when I write something down, 
um, I sort of give it away, you know, and like lose it in a weird way. Um, 100%. You, know, you know, it's like, it's like, cause you know, I've, I've written about things that are like near and dear, you know, to my heart, like we all have. Right. And I often feel like when I'm in that process of sort of crafting that memory or, you know, packaging it up in, in whatever way I think will be most uh, impactful to someone else. And then when it's done and it's gone, it's not that I don't remember it, but it's almost like I feel like it's um, it's like I feel like I, I feel like I've gave it away. You know what I'm saying? And like, and it's not it's not quite as present anymore. I don't I don't know. It's it's weird. I don't know if that maybe I'm maybe it's just me. <laughs> no, I have the thing where if, if I write something by hand, like in a in a journal, mm-hmm. I'll go back to it and read it, and I don't remember writing it, and I don't mm-hmm. remember at all what the sentence was, and like it's like all right. I, there's probably 50 journals full of stuff that I will never look back at and it's just kind of gone right yeah sort of like you got it you gave it away in a weird it's strange but but when you but when you keep it in there you keep chewing on it yeah Uh, um I agree with you I mean I and this is terrible advice so I hope most people have have tuned off by now um but like (laughs) <laughs> but you know all the writers who are like you need to you need to carry a notebook around with you and write down every idea you have i'm always like that's awful advice um because most of the ideas you you have are shitty you know i mean they're they're not good but but the ones that like stick with you you know what i'm saying like i mean i have, dude, like the novel i'm working on right now i had the idea for this in like 2001 probably you know honestly i'm not i'm not exaggerating right but that one won't go away you know, and so yeah. the ones that, and sometimes it's an image, sometimes it's a plot, whatever it might be. I feel like if you if you trust yourself to sort of like remember those good ideas, like they're going to keep coming back and knocking on the door. Yeah. You know, and saying, "Hey, there's something about you that's compelling you to write this." Right. Um, so I don't I don't do that. I don't I don't sit around and write down every idea I have. If I if I did, I would spiral into depression. Um, <laughs> about how terrible my ideas are um but the good ones stick you know yeah. um so has has uh have you had to adapt with having a child uh at the right you know uh, are you not writing at all right now are you just thinking or what's going on i think it's more in my head now i mean i, I definitely can scribble down um ideas um you know here and there but i really do feel like i'm, I'm getting a lot more done mentally than i am actually yeah well you have you have to adapt man i mean you know i know i've told you this anecdotally too uh but you know when i was in graduate school i'm sure i was very much like you like i'd go out to the bar hang out with my friends go home you know knock out the first draft of a story revise it the next couple of days or whatever i could write drunk whatever okay once i had a kid that that all had to change you know, I mean, because I recognize my previous model was not working anymore. I had to get up super early mm-hmm. when the baby got up. And so I started getting up like, I don't know, whatever, 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning, writing until uh, Magnolia, my daughter got up when she was an infant. Right. So you have to change. Well, now that doesn't work anymore. Right. Because now my kids, you know, are like 13 and eight or they, you know, 13 and nine. Process. They got to get up. And, yeah. Yeah. They got to get up and go to school, you know. So it's, you know, I'm not getting up at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, doing all that type of stuff anymore. I got to get up, make breakfast, right? So now, and I've got a full-time job, you know, and so now I've just had to like find one day. I just, now I'm just like a one day a week person, like Wednesday. I'm like, don't mess with me on Wednesday, right? Cause I'm, I'm tinkering. That's your writing day. That's my day. I'm not going to answer your freaking emails. I'm not going to go into the office. I'm not going to do anything on Wednesday. Um, that's my day to tinker. And some, you know, some days it's good. I'll get, you know, get some new words. Some days it's just revision, whatever, but I've, I've got to find some way, man. Like, and, and you just have to adapt, um, yeah. to whatever your life situation is. So it doesn't matter if you're a stay at home parent, if you're working 40 hours a week, if you're service industry, it, it, it doesn't matter. You got to adapt and find a way that works for you. Um, you know, if, you if any writer words in here and there, like you can always figure out how to squeeze some sentences in. Whatever it is, yeah, on your notes app or something. It doesn't yeah. matter. I do that, yeah. Yeah, any writer that tells you there's a certain way to get it done is absolutely lying. Yeah, they're lying, right? Uh, adapt, make it happen, because 
And, you know, you've heard me say this a million times, like the, the only way to ensure, right, that you're not going to get this dream that you want is to not write. <laughs> that's, that's it, right? That's the only way to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, so just don't do that and you'll be okay, right? <laughs> Okay, so I want to, um, I know we're, we're getting near the end of our time here, so I, I want to show people something, and I want you to talk a little about this. <laughs> still have it? Are you kidding? Of course. I still have it in the exact same place. I took it off the wall right now because I knew I was going to be talking to you. Can you tell people a little bit about this um, and, and what's going on here? So that's a gift uh, that I gave to Neil, uh, named after uh, one of both of our favorite short stories. Mm -hmm. by a writer named Lewis Norton mm -hmm. called Owls. And uh, if you have not read it, uh, I would go out right now and read that story. Yeah, so it's, it's supposed to be like a slow sign, right? But in the, in the story, the narrator reinterprets it to say Owls because he wants, because that's what his dad tells him it says, you know, and he wants so badly for his dad to be, you know, a sort of magical and good and good person, right? And so the thing, the thing to me about a sign like this is that it's probably my favorite gift I've ever gotten in my life uh, because it also reminds me of what I think a lot of people, if they're watching this, uh, need to recognize is, is that, you know, although the writing process, right, is lonely, right, and you're by yourself and you're, you know, in your PJs and you're making shit up or whatever, uh, the writing community is not that way, right? And find your people, right? Because I recognized with Andrew, as I hope he recognized with, with me, is that, you know, we sort of found each other and we found each other through stories, right? Stories that both connected to us, right? Uh, and that's an example of one uh, is Lewis Norton's story, Owls. And so every time I walk into my garage right now, I not only get to be reminded uh, of one of my favorite stories of all time, but to be reminded that there's other people out there that appreciate, you know, what we do, right? And, and the way that we help each other, right? Um, and so I, I can't tell you how much I love it, man. I mean, I just, I look Can at I it. One more thing about the sign? Yeah, please. For anyone that's, if anybody is still watching this mm -hmm. at this point, uh, Neil almost got that uh, owls tattooed onto his body somewhere. <laughs> That's true. I, I really love the story. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, just to make sure people know, writing is lonely. The writing world is not. Uh, you know, if you seek out those people, there's others out there uh, that are looking for you. And one great way to do it would be to uh, to get Andrew's book and start there, right? Um, and to go, go to things like the Tennessee Williams Festival, right? It's just filthy with writers. Um, and go so, to uh, University of New Orleans if you want to MFA. That, that's right, right? Um, all right. Well, Andrew, uh, thank you so much, man, uh, for this. And thanks to Tennessee Williams Festival. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So we'll, we'll wave uh, and say goodbye.